Okay, get ready, whatever you want to do, design. or whatever you want to watch, and hey, ah. there, she'll take care of us, so you don't need to worry about it. It is for us. It's not clinging anymore. Okay, Carrie, it's everything. And uh, leave the lights up, he wants to catch Wachwadugi. I don't know why, but he don't know how better, you know. To the divine ones of Trikea, who are the embodiment of the all-enlightened mind itself of basis. The foreword. This treatise appertains to the profound doctrine self-liberation by meditating upon the peaceful and wrathful deities. It expounds the yoga of knowing the mind, the seeing of reality, self-liberation. By this method, one's mind is understood. Blessed disciples, ponder these teachings deeply. Samaya, Gaya, 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 Emo. All hail to the one mind that embraces a whole Sangsara Nirvana, that eternally is as it is, yet is unknown, that although ever clear and ever existing is not visible, that although radiant and unobscured is not recognized, these teachings supplement those of the Buddhas. These teachings are for the purpose of enabling one to know this mind. All that has been taught, taught heretofore by the Buddhas of the three times in virtue of their having known this mind as recorded in the door of Dharma consisting of 84,000 slokas and elsewhere remains incomprehensible. The conquerors are not elsewhere taught anything concerning the one time mind. Although as vast as the illimitable sky, the sacred <coughs> scriptures contain but few words relating to knowledge of the mind. This, the true explanation of these eternal teachings of the conquerors, constitutes a correct method of their practical application. Kai, kai, ho, blessed disciples, hearken. The result of not knowing the one mind, knowledge of that which is vulgarly called mind is widespread. Inasmuch as the one mind is unknown or thought of erroneously or known one-sidedly, without being thoroughly known as it is, desire for these teachings will be immeasurable. They'll also be sought after by ordinary individuals who, not knowing the one mind, do not know themselves. They wander hither and thither through the three regions, and thus among the six classes of beings, suffering sorrow. Such is the result of their error of not having attained understanding of their mind. Because their suffering is in every way overpowering, even self-control is lacking to them. They are overwhelmed by suffering and are in darkness because of their suffering. Although the middle path contains a twofold truth, because of desires it finally becomes obscured. Likewise, desires obscure Kriya, Yoga, and Siva Sadhana. The transcendent at one moment. There are really, there is no duality. Pluralism is untrue until duality is transcended and atonement is realized. Enlightenment cannot be attained. The whole sanctuary and nirvana as an inseparable unity are one's mind. Owing to worldly beliefs which he is free to accept or reject, he wanders in the sangsara. Therefore, practicing the Dharma freed from every attachment, grasp the whole essence of these teachings expounded in this yoga of self-liberation by knowing the mind in its real nature. <clears throat> the truths set forth herein are known as the great self-liberation, and in them culminates the doctrine of the great ultimate perfection. Samaya, Gaya, Gaya. That which is commonly called mind is of intuitive wisdom 
<laughs> Although the one mind is, it has no existence. Although the source of all the bliss of nirvana and all the sorrows of samsara, it is cherished like the eleven yanas. The various names given to it are innumerable. Some call it the mental self. Certain heretics call it the ego, the hinayanists. It's called essentiality of doctrines. Yogacara called wisdom. The means of attaining the other shore of wisdom, the Buddha essence, the great symbol, the soul seed, the potentiality of truth, the all foundation. Ordinary names they are also given to it. Part two, the practical application. If one knows how to apply this in a threefold manner, this knowing of the mind, all past knowledge less to memory becomes perfectly clear, and also knowledge of the future, thought of as unborn and unconceived. In the present, when the mind remains as it is naturally, it's ordinarily comprehended by its own state. Mind in its true state. This is what is happening in each one of you, in your own minds, here and now. All of the things that this states about mind, you have as well. What you're doing with it is up to you. When one seeks one's mind in its true state, it's found to be quite intelligible, although invisible. In its true state, mind is naked, immaculate, not made of anything. Being of the voidness, clear, vacuous, without duality, transparent, timeless, uncompounded, unimpeded, colorless, not realizable as a separate thing, but as a unity of all things, yet not composed of them, of one taste and transcendent over differentiation. Nor is one's own mind separable from other minds. To realize the quintessential being of the one mind is to realize the immutable at one of the trikaya. The mind being as the uncreated of the voidness, the dharmakaya, as the vacuous and self-radiant, the samhogakaya, as the unobscured shining with all living creatures, the nirmanakaya, is the primordial essence wherein its three divine aspects are one and is called the trikaya. If the yogic application of this wisdom be thorough, one will comprehend that which has been set forth above. Mind is non-created. Mind in its true nature being non-created and self-radiant, how can one without having knowing the mind assert that mind is created? There being in this yoga nothing objective upon which to meditate. How can one without having ascertained the true nature of mind by meditation, assert that mind is created. Mind in its true state being reality, how can one without having discovered one's own mind, assert that mind is created? Mind in its true state being undoubtedly ever existing, how can one without having seen the mind face to face, assert that mind is created? The thinking principle being of the very essence of mind, how can one without having sought and found it assert that mind is created? Mind being transcended over creation and thus partaking of the uncreated, how can one assert that mind is created? Above the mind being in this bright mortal, unmodified naturalness, non created, as it should be taken to be, and without form. How can one assert that it is created? Inasmuch as mind can also be taken to be devoid of quality, how can one venture to assert that it is created? The self-born qualityless mind, being like the three voids, undifferentiated, unmodified, how can one assert that mind is created? Mind being without objectivity and causation, self-originated. Self-born, how can one without having endeavored to know the mind assert that mind is created? Inasmuch as divine wisdom dawns in accordance with one's own time and one is emancipated, how can opponents of these teachings 
assert that it is created. Mind being as it is of this nature and thus unknowable, how can one assert that it is created? Now we come to the yoga of introspection. The one mind being verily the voidness and without any foundation. One's mind is likewise as vacuous as the sky. To know whether this be so or not, look within thine own mind. Being of the voidness and thus not to be conceived as having beginning or ending, self-born wisdom has in reality been shining forever, like the sun's essentiality, its self-born born. To know whether this be so or not, Divine wisdom is undoubtedly unstructable, unbreakable, like the ever-flowing current of a river. To know whether this be so or not, being merely a flex of instability like the air of the firmament, objective appearances are without power to fascinate and fetter. To know whether this be so or not, all appearances are truly one's own concepts, self-conceived in the mind, like reflection seen in a mirror. To know whether this be so or not, arising of themselves and being naturally free, like the clouds in the sky. All external appearances verily fade away into their own respective places. To know whether this be so or not, the Dharma being nowhere save in the mind, there's no other place to meditation on the mind. The Dharma being nowhere safe in the mind, there is no other doctrine to be taught or practiced elsewhere. The Dharma being said nowhere safe in the mind, there is no other place of truth for the observance of a vow. The Dharma being nowhere safe in the mind, there is no Dharma elsewhere whereby liberation may be attained. Again and again, look within. When looking outwards into the vacuity of space, there's no place to be found where the mind is shining. When looking inward in one's own mind, in the search of the shining, there's to be found no one thing that shines. One's own mind is transparent with qual out quality. Being of the clear light of the voidness, one's own mind is of the Dharmakaya. And being void of quality is comparable to a cloudless sky. It is not a multiplicity and is omniscient. Very great indeed is the difference between knowing and not knowing the import of these teachings, the wondrousness of these teachings. This self-originated clear light, eternally unborn. Being not created, it's natural wisdom. Not knowing birth, it knows not death. Wondrous is this. Although it is total reality, there is no perceiver of it. Wondrous is this. Although wandering in the sangsara, it remains undefiled by evil. Wondrous is this. Although seeing the Buddha, it remains unallied to good. Wondrous is this. Although possessed by all being, it is not recognized. Wondrous is this. Those not knowing the fruit of this yoke, Yoga, seek other yoga. Thank you. Although the clear light of reality shines in one's own mind, the multitude look for it elsewhere. Good. All hail to this wisdom here set forth concerning the invisible immaculate mind. This teaching is the most excellent of teachings. This meditation devoid of mental concentration, all embracing, free from every imperfection is the most excellent of meditation. This practice concerning the uncreated state, when rightly comprehended, is the most excellent of practices. This fruit of the yoga of the eternally unsought, naturally produced, is the most excellent of fruits. Herewith we have accurately revealed the fourfold great path. This teaching without error, this great path, is of the clear wisdom here set forth, which being clear and unerring is called? This meditation upon this unerring great path is of the clear wisdom here set forth, which being clear and unerring is called? 
This practice relating to this unerring great path is the clear wisdom here set forth, which being clear and unerring is called the fruit of this unerring great path is the clear wisdom here set forth, which being clear and unerring is called the great light. The yoga also concerns the foundation of the immutable great light. The teachings of this changeless great light is of the unique clear wisdom here set forth, which illuminating the three times is called the meditation upon this changeless great light is a unique clear wisdom here set forth, which illuminating the three times is called the practice relating to this changeless great light is a unique clear wisdom here set forth, which illuminating the three times is called the fruit of this changeless great light is a unique clear wisdom here set forth, which illuminating the three times is called and now we come to the doctrine of the three times. The essence of this doctrine concerning the three times in atonement will now be expounded. The yoga concerning past and future not being practiced, memory of the past remains latent. The future not being welcomed is completely severed by the mind from the present. And the present not being fixable remains in the state of voidness. The yoga of the nirvanic path, there being no thing upon which to meditate. No meditation is there whatsoever. There being no thing to go astray, no going astray there, if one is guided by memory. Without meditating, without going astray, look into the true state wherein self-cognition, self-knowledge, self-illumination shine resplendently. And those shine are called in the realm of wisdom transcendent over all meditation, naturally illimited, where there is no going astray, the vacuous concepts, self-liberation and the primordial voidness are of the Dharmakaya. Without realization of this, the goal of the Nirvanic path is unattainable. Simultaneously with this realization, the Vajrasattva state is realized. These teachings are exhaustive of all knowledge, exceedingly deep and immeasurable. Although they are to be contemplated in a variety of ways, to this mind of self-cognition and self-originated wisdom, there are no two such things as contemplator and contemplation. When exhaustively contemplated, these teachings merge in one name with the scholarly seeker who is sought and although the seeker himself when sought cannot be found, thereupon is attained the goal of the seeking and also the end of the search itself. Then nothing more is there to be taught, nor is there need to seek anything. This beginningless, vacuous, non-confused, clear wisdom of self-cognition is the very same as that set forth in the doctrine of the great perfection. Although there are no two such things as knowing and not knowing, there are profound and innumerable sorts of meditation, and surpassingly excellent it is in the end of no one's mind. There being no two such things as object of meditation, meditator, if by those who practice or do not practice meditation, the meditator of the meditation be sought and not found, thereupon the goal of the meditation is reached, and also the end of the meditation itself. There being new to two such things as meditation, an object of meditation. There's no need to follow the sway of deeply obscuring ignorance. Dig this sentence. It gives you the answer for the whole damn thing, if you're trying. For as a result of meditation on the unmodified quiescence of mind, the non-created wisdom instantaneously shines forth clearly. If you've learned how to clear your mind and conscience and be there.
and not stuck in what you're hung up with. Get off clear and give you a clearance of, oh well, it's not like that. Although there are an innumerable variety of profound practice, if one's mind is in its true state, they are non-existent. There are no such things as existence and non-existence. There are no such things as practice and practitioner. If by those who practice or do not practice the practitioner of the practice be sought and not found, thereupon the goal of the practice is reached and also the end of the practice itself. Inasmuch from eternity, there's nothing whatsoever to be practiced. There's no need to fall under the sway of errant propensities. The non-created self-radiant wisdom here set forth, being actionless, immaculate, transcendent over acceptance or rejection, is itself the perfect practice. Although there are no two such things as pure and impure, there are innumerable kinds of fruits of yoga, all of which to one's mind in its true state are the conscious content of the tri, not cr created tree, kaya. There being no two such things as action and performer of action, if one seeks a performer of action, and no performer of action be found anywhere, thereupon the goal of fruit obtaining is reached and also the final consummation itself. There being no other method where whatsoever of obtaining its fruit, there's no need to fall into the sway of dualities, of accepting, rejecting, trusting, and distrusting these teachings. Realization of the self-radiant, self-born wisdom as a manifestation of the trikaya in the self cognizing mind is a very fruit of attaining the perfect from nirvana. Explanation of the names given to this wisdom. This wisdom delivers one from the eternally transitory eight aims. Inasmuch as it doesn't fall under the sway of any extreme, it's called the middle path. It is called wisdom because of its unbroken continuity of memory being the essence of the vacuity of the mind. It's called the essence of the Buddhas. If the significance of these teachings were known to all beings, surpassingly excellent would it be. Therefore these teachings are called the means of attaining the other shore of wisdom, or transcendental wisdom. To them who passed away in the nirvana, this mind is both beginningless and endless. Therefore, it's called the great symbol. It is this, this, as much as this mind being known and by not being known becomes a foundation of all the joys of nirvana and all the sorrows of samsara. It's called the all foundation. The impatient ordinary person when dwelling in his fleshly body calls this very clear wisdom common and challenging. I would say super conscious, common intelligence. Regardless of whatever other or varied names be given to this wisdom as a result of a thorough study, what wisdom other than it, as here revealed, can one really desire? To desire more than this wisdom is to like one who seeks an elephant for following, by following its footprints when the elephant self has been found. Quite impossible, is it, even though one seeks throughout the three regions to find the Buddha elsewhere than in the mind, your mind. Although he that is ignorant of this may seek externally or outside the mind to know himself, how is it possible to find oneself when seeking others rather than He that thus seeks to know himself is like a fool, giving a performance in the midst of a crowd, forgetting who he is, and then seeking everywhere to find himself. This simile also applies to one's erring in other ways, unless one knows or sees a natural state of substance or things, and recognizes the light of the mind, 
release from samsara is untamable. And once one sees the Buddha in one mind, nirvana is obscure. Excuse me. Although the wisdom of nirvana and the ignorance of sankara illusionally appear to be two things, they cannot truly be differentiated. It's an error to conceive of them, otherwise them as well. Erring and non-erring are intrinsically also unity. By not taking your mind to be naturally a duality and allowing it as the primordial consciousness to abide in its own place, beings attain deliverance. The error of doing otherwise than this arises not from ignorance in the mind itself, but from not having sought to know the that. Seek within thine own self-illuminated, self-originated mind, whence firstly all such concepts arise, secondly where they exist, and lastly whither they vanish. This realization is likened to that of a crow, which although already in possession of a bond, flies off elsewhere to quench its thirst, and finding no other drinking place, returns to the one pond. Similarly, the radiance which emanates from the one mind, by emanating from one's own mind, emancipates the mind. The one mind, omniscient, vacuous, immaculate, eternally the unobscured voidness, void of quality as the sky, self-originated wisdom shining clearly, imperishably, is itself the thatness. The whole visible universe also symbolizes the one mind. By knowing the all consciousness in one's mind, one knows it to be as void of quality as the sky. Although the sky may be taken for visually as an illustration of the unpredictable thatness, it is only symbolically so, inasmuch as the vacuity of all visible things is to be recognized as merely analogous to the apparent vacuity of the sky, devoid of mind, content, and form. The knowing of the mind does not depend on the sky symbol. Therefore, not straying from the path, remain in the very state of voidness. Now we come to the yogic science of mental concepts. The various concepts, too, being illusory, none of them real fade away accordingly. Thus, for example, everything postulated of the whole of Sangsara and Nirvana arise from nothing more than mental concepts, changes in one's train of thought, or in one's association of ideas, produces corresponding changes in one's conception of the external world. Therefore, the various views concerning things are due merely to different mental concepts. The six classes of beings respectively conceive ideas in different ways. The unenlightened externally see the externally transitory duly. The various doctrines are seen in accordance with one's own mental concepts. As a thing is viewed, so it appears. In other words, everything depends on how you look at it. No two people in the place thinking the same as they, yourself. Huh? All, all depends on how you look at it. Everything. To see things as a multiplicity and so cleave unto separateness is to err. Now follows the yoga of knowing all mental concepts. Seeing of the radiance of this Wisdom or mind which shines without being perceived is Buddhahood. Heard what's just said to you? You're all Buddhas. All of you. Here. If the potentiality that within each one of you is brought to its fruition, you'll have it all. If you don't have it, so you don't have it. You'll take it again. You'll do it again. Mixed I a mistake not. By not controlling one's thoughts, one error. By controlling and understanding a thought process in one's mind, emancipation is attained automatically. In general, all things mentally perceived are concepts. The bodily forms in which the world of appearance is contained are concepts of the mind. Quintessence of the six classes of beings is also a mental concept. 
happiness of gods in the heaven worlds of men is another mental concept. Three, unhappy states of suffering. Two, also, concept of the mind. Ignorance, misery, five poisons. Likewise, mental concepts. Likewise, divine wisdom is also a concept of the mind. The full realization of the passing away into nirvana is also a concept of mind. Misfortune caused by demons and evil spirits is also a concept of mind. Gods and good fortune are also concepts of mind. Likewise, the various perfections are mental concepts. Unconscious one point, it's also a mental concept. The color of object, any objective thing is also a mental concept. The qualityless and the formless is also a mental concept. The one and the many in agreement is also a mental concept. Existence and non-existence, as well as non-created, are concepts of the mind. The realization of the great liberation. Nothing save mind is conceivable. Mind, when uninhibited, conceives all that comes into existence. And that which comes into existence is like the wave of an ocean and the state of mind transcendent over all dualities brings liberation. It matters not what name may careless be applied to mind, truly mind is one. And apart from mind there's none else. The unique one mind is foundationless and hurtless, nothing else to be realized. Non-created is the non-visible. By knowing the invisible voidness and the clear light, although not seeing them separately, there being no multiplicity in the voidness, one's clear mind may be known, yet the thatness itself is not knowable. Mind is beyond nature, but is experienced in bodily forms. The realization of the one mind constitutes the all deliverance. Without mastery of the mental process, there can be no realization. Similarly, although sesame seed is source of oil and milk is the health source of butter, not until the seed be pressed and the milk churn do the oil and butter appear. Although sentient beings are of the Buddha essence itself, not until they realize this can they attain nirvana. Even how her a cow how her how what the hell is a how her? <laughs> What's a cow or an illiterate person may by realization attain liberation? Concluding section General Conclusion Though lacking in the power of expression, the author is here made a faithful record of his own yogic experiences. To one who has tasted honey, it is superfluous for those who have not tasted it, to offer an explanation of its taste. Not knowing the one mind, even pandits go astray. Despite their cleverness in expounding the many different doctrinal systems, to give ear to the reports of one who has neither approached nor seen the Buddha even for a moment is like hearkening of flying rumors concerning a distant place one has never visited. Simultaneously with the knowledge and the knowing of the mind comes a release from good and evil. If the mind is not known, all practice and good and evil result in nothing more than heaven or hell or the sangsara. Sangsara is a place we're living in now. Heaven or hell is a place we wonder about it whether we're going to get what we've got coming or we'll get something left. And it's a lot of hooey. We've got to find out find out the truth. It kind of explains it in a little way. As soon as one's mind is known to be of the wisdom of voidness, concepts like good and evil karma cease to exist. Even in the empty sky, which seems to be, but is not a fountain of water. So, in the voidness, neither good nor evil. When one's mind is thus known in its nakedness, this doctrine of seeing the mind naked, this self-liberation, 
this seemed to be exceedingly profound. Seek therefore thine own wisdom within. And within is the vast deep. All hail, this is the knowing of the mind, the seeing of reality. And for the sake of future generations, who shall be born during the age of darkness, these essential aphorisms, necessarily brief and concise, herein set forth, were written down in accordance with tantric teachings. Although taught during this present epoch, the text of them was hidden away amidst a cache of precious things. May this book be read by those blessed devotees of the future. So Maya, Gaia, Gaia, Gaia. Vast, vast, vast is divine wisdom. These teachings called the knowing of the mind and the self-identifying, self-realizing, self-liberating reality formulated by Padmasambhava, the spiritually endowed teacher from your game. May they not wane till the whole saying Sarah is empty. Self-salvation. Therefore, O Ananda, be ye lamps unto yourselves. Be you a refuge to yourselves. Betake yourself to no external refuge. Hold fast to the truth as a lamp. Hold fast to the truth as a refuge. Look not for refuge to anyone besides yourself. And this is something that was written to me, one of my teachers. He makes a sort of a synthesis of what we're all trying to get anyway, in a way. The clear light is a source of light which lighteth everyone of humankind that cometh into the world. It is a radiance of cosmic consciousness. The yogins realize it while still in the fleshly body, and all mankind glimpse it at the moment of death. It's the light of the Buddha, of the Christ, and of all masters of life. And to the devotee in whom it shines unimpededly, it is the Guru and the Deliverer. Gati Gati Para Gati Parasam Gati Bodhisattva Gati Gati Para Gati Parasam Gati Bodhisattva Gati Gati Para Gati Parasam Gati Bodhisattva